What's up guys, Al here from AM Train. So today I'm going to go ahead and do part two of the three part series on how to switch over from high bar to low bar squatting. And if you guys didn't see part one, boom, go ahead and click on that little box there um, and it'll take you to part one. But don't worry if you guys haven't seen part one, um, it doesn't, this part two series doesn't quite build too much on part one, but I do suggest you go, go ahead and check it out because it's a pretty darn good video if I say so myself. Anyways, let's go ahead and move on to what we're going to go ahead and talk about. Uh, wrist wraps. Wrist wraps is, a wonder, is probably one of the biggest ones I thought that has helped me out with uh, transitioning from high bar to low bar. And the reason for that is because my mobility was uh, pretty darn good and I, I, talk about, I talk a lot about mobility when it comes to uh, squatting or transitioning from high bar to low bar. And since I didn't really have a problem to begin with too much, uh, just because I work at a physical therapy office and you know where I'm doing stretches and everything, stretches and mobility work along with patients themselves, um, this is probably the number one thing that has helped me out. And you want to go ahead and get a really good quality wrist wrap because I've had the Elite FTS uh, wrist wraps. I can't even remember which one. I can't even find them because uh, since I got these, I, I mean, I pretty much forgot about those because there's a big difference. These, these are APT Convict uh, wrist wraps and I feel like they uh, distribute the force and, and it feels nice and snug all evenly through my wrist. And the reason why you want to go ahead and get wrist wraps when you're transitioning from high bar to low bar is because it kind of um, allows you to get into that end range motion if you don't have that too much mo if you don't have too much mobility and it'll be comfortable for you. So it kind of uh, evenly distributes the force um, throughout that uh, throughout that area because the wrist can't really take too much uh, uh, can't really take too much force on it. Um, it's a smaller joint compared to the elbow and shoulder, so you want to go ahead and uh, protect your wrists. So rule of thumb with wrist wraps, buy nice, not twice. So these are about, I think, 40 bucks. My brother actually bought them and I stole them from him. And like I said, my Elite FTS ones were like 12 bucks on sale. And I definitely regret buying those because uh, these definitely are the way to go. Another reason why you might have elbow pain is not just because of bad shoulder mobility, like I said in part one, um, it is that it might be bad thoracic mobility. So if you don't have proper thoracic extension um, where you have that nice mobility going backwards for your upper back, um, that might be a problem, especially when you're in that uh, low bar stance because you want to be able to puff out the chest a little and actually get that um, thoracic extension. When I go like this, this is the back and this is the uh, upper back. That's what I'm visualizing. Anyways, um, so yeah, if you want to go ahead and pr improve your thoracic mobility, go ahead and do the foam roller exercise that the main thing that you want to do, you guys probably seen this a lot, um, so I'm not really going to go into detail on it, is that you want to make sure that you breathe out as you extend backwards and you really want to wrap the upper back around that foam roll because the reason why you want to do that is when you exhale, uh, you tend to uh, get all that air out that's protecting you to your spine, kind of having that, you know how people talk about intra-abdominal pressure, same thing is happening if you have air in your lungs. It's almost trying to bend a balloon that's inflated. It's really hard to bend a balloon that's inflated unless you start deflating that balloon and it'll be pretty much nice and pliable. Same thing here, you want to really get that stretch for that upper back. So what that means for you guys that are meatheads out there that are pretty much uh, pushing three times as much as you're pulling, you're going to sit like this. And you're probably sitting like this right now, hunched over and watching this wonderful video, and you're just pretty much hunched over and you guys are in a bad position. You guys probably even drive like that. So that's uh, probably a bad thing. In the gym, you're probably doing it well. Like I said, you guys are doing that thoracic extension exercise and you guys are have nice tall posture, especially in the gym, because you guys are trying to see those uh, nice little, um, what do you call them? Women in those Louis Lemon tights. Anyways, uh, yeah, you guys puff out your chest. You guys have pretty good posture then, except you guys have that imaginary lat syndrome, but I digress. Uh, you guys puff out your chest and you have that nice, wonderful posture, but once you start watching or on YouTube videos, you start watching on the computer, start to hunch forward. And the reason why people that tend to push more than they pull is that the, the, the back muscles tend to be a little bit weaker. So that's just me ranting about posture. So make sure your posture is well if you uh, want to start pretty much with that, anything. Who cares about if it's a high bar to low bar? Just get good posture because that tends to be a major factor in why we see a lot of people at physical therapy. All right, so now, of course, I'm gonna talk about mobility of the hips because when you are transitioning from high bar to low bar, it all depends on uh, the stance. And of course, everyone's seen the Mark Ripito uh, picture of the three 
um, pretty much bar position determines torso angle and so your torso angle is going to be definitely more leaning forward just because uh, the bar placement. So what that means is that your hip is going to actually have uh, to be more, it's going to have to have more mobility uh, compared to the ankle mobility that a high bar requires. So um, in order to get depth in a low bar, you're going to have to have a little bit more better, uh, more better, sorry, bad English. You're going to have to have better mobility in the area, so you want to make sure that you have great uh, hip mobility. And I've done uh, videos on this on stretching before. I'll go ahead and post uh, this kind of uh, video right here where it tells you how to stretch out. Um, if you're having pain in the bottom of a squat, you might have to stretch out that joint capsule using bands. So when you're in that low bar position, you are going to have to have your stance a little bit wider. The reason why you have uh, the stance a little bit wider is, like I said, to allow that torso to uh, uh, drop in, to open up the hips a little bit is what uh, people will say. And basically what you do when you open up the hips, it allows more hip flexion. And basically that will help you out uh, gain that depth. Whoops, I had to fix my camera because it was slowly tilting back. Maybe my camera was falling asleep or maybe it's just because I had a really bad uh, Amazon tripod thing that totally sucks and I need to get a new one. Anyways, what I was saying was that um, the great thing about opening up your hips is that it's going to decrease the lever arm, um, or the lever arm, the moment arm between uh, you, your hips and the bar. So when you open up your hips, it's going to basically decrease the, the, the space between your hips and the bar and also at the same time it's also going to decrease the, the space between your knee joint and your uh, and, and the bar so you are pretty much being a little bit more um, a little bit more efficient so hopefully you'll be able to lift more weight that way um, I'm kind of surprised I didn't switch over to low bar in the beginning just because um, I have stronger hips of course everyone has stronger hips than uh, their knees so uh, their knee joint Oh yeah, another great thing about having a wider stance is that you get to take advantage of using more muscles. Um, Mark Ripito and even uh, Louis Simmons talks about how the, um, your groin or your adductor definitely contributes to the hip extension. And so when you're using more muscles, of course you're going to squat more weight. So it's just another muscle you can add into uh, to making sure that you lift as much weight as you can. So like I was saying before, hip mobility is going to be pretty important and I've linked uh, or I posted a little video here before to, uh, on a video I did a long time ago where I talk about the concave convex rule. And what the concave convex rule uh, means is that whenever there is your hip joint and the socket, so ball and socket, um, when it goes forward, when your femur goes forward, your, uh, the ball has to pretty much go backwards, it has to uh, travel backwards. I go into depth more more where uh, you'll get a really good stretch using bands in order to stretch out that uh, hip capsule that might be a limiting factor. So one thing I noticed when I was transitioning from high bar to low bar is that because of that extra hip flexion, um, I had to make sure that my uh, hip flexors were on par. So not only uh, do people talk about how you know short hip flexors can be when they are always sitting. When people are always sitting, your hip flexors are going to be in that shortened position. And so not only are they in a shortened position, but here's something that's going to blow your mind, is that uh, they're also going to be weak. Because they can be weak and short at the same time. I know, you better have a condom on your head because you, I just mind fucked you. So, what you can do about that is there are two exercises that um, I've kind of incorporated in my training is that uh, to train the hip flexors, to really get, get them strong, not only should you be stretching them, but you want to also be strengthening on them. Strengthening them because not, it's important to have uh, the right length in the hip, hip flexor and also the right strength, especially since we're always squatting and squatting and not really doing anything for our hip flexors, unless you're using them right, correct, and really uh, pulling down as you squat and really flexing them. Dave Tate, um, he always talks about how you have to use the hip flexors when you're in doing a box squat. So what he said, I remember he said, when you're box squatting, when you go into that box, you want to almost have that ghetto booty, like sit down on the box and then really ghetto booty it, meaning uh, lift your tailbone in the air and you should really feel your hip flexors enough for you where you can actually uh, tuck like a why am I thinking dirty like a ball sack? Just tuck a, um, uh, tuck a Eryx underneath you or, or uh, two boards underneath you kind of thing. So you should be able to uh, anteriorly, uh, anteriorly pelvic tilt uh, your pelvis. 
pretty much, you should be able to tilt that pelvis enough and where you're using that hip flexor. Because a lot of people, when they have that little butt wink at the bottom, everyone always you know, gives the high and mighty uh, erector sp uh, spinae um, all the glory. They always, you gotta strengthen them so you can make sure you don't have that butt wink, but you, people don't realize that the hip flexors have a synergistic role to actually pull on the pelvis as well to get that tilt. So make sure that you are stretching it and getting those exercises. So the exercise that I have uh, incorporated in my um, incorporated in my training is Mike Boyle's. Uh, he popularized this one. Where basically, so this is one where Mike Boyle made popular, where he is putting his, he pops up his leg, he go ahead puts his hand behind his back, and he raises up. So not only are you squeezing the glute right here in order to keep that pelvis nice and steady, so you don't get that bending from the low back, you also want to, you really want to concentrate on that hip flexor. So nice and tall, coming straight up and down. And if you don't have the strength to do that, if you prop your leg up and you feel like you can't even lift it any more than that, um, that shows you that you have a problem. So another hip flexor exercise that I learned was uh, from Eric Cressy, where he tells you to get a tennis ball and place it in the middle of your hip here, uh, right in that crease, hold it nice and tight to make sure it's right in there get in a single leg uh, bridging position and really squeeze through and you're tightening through. And I do a couple of that just to make sure that um, my, I have enough hip flexion and uh, hip flexion strength in order to keep that position throughout the bridge because that's what's going to be hard is that throughout the whole bridging um, movement that top part is going to be the hardest part to hold that hip flexion especially if you have tight or weak hip flexors, which are the things that we're trying to address. All right guys, that was part two of the three part series. Hopefully I talked about everything I wanted to talk about. If you guys have any questions about the exercises, definitely post them down below because um, I didn't really go into much detail about them because I know that you, you've probably seen them before and you could really um, pretty much look them up on your own. But I'll definitely post a uh, couple links down below. Hopefully I can find them and put them in uh, the description box. So other than that guys, train hard, train smart.